And of course, if you need a Bible, there are Bibles you probably noticed by the door as you came in. You're welcome to take one to follow along. We're going to be in Acts chapter 13. And walking through the book of Acts, we have a ways to go. We've come a ways, but there's lots of exciting and transforming stories still to come. It's important to remember that we come each week to the greatest power at work in the world, the Word of God. In His Word, God is active, and it is impossible for us to leave this Word unchanged. We either grow toward God or away from Him every time we come into contact with His Word. And it's my prayer that will be energized by the power of his word this morning. So let's begin reading Acts chapter 13, verse 1. Now there were in the church at Antioch prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Menaean, a member of the court of Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then, after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. So, being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. When they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews, and they had John to assist them. When they had gone through the whole island as far as Paphos, they came upon a certain magician, a Jewish false prophet named Bar-Jesus. He was with the proconsul Sergius Paulus, a man of intelligence, who summoned Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. But Elemus the magician, for that is the meaning of his name, opposed them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. But Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him and said, You son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, full of all deceit and villainy, Will you not stop making crooked the straight paths of the Lord? And now, behold, the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you will be blind and unable to see the sun for a time. Immediately, mist and darkness fell upon him, and he went about seeking people to lead him by the hand. Then the proconsul believed when he saw what had occurred, For he was astonished at the teaching of the Lord. Some of you might know the name Adoniram Judson. Adoniram Judson was a missionary. He is known to be the first missionary from our country to a foreign country. And before Judson went on his Uh, journey that would ultimately take him away from his homeland for decades and accomplish incredible fruit and effort for the gospel, he met a young woman named Anne, Anne Hasseltine. And he declared his intention to become a suitor. But as all godly men should do, he wrote to her father first to ask for permission. Now, it's not that he asked permission as such, but it's the way he asked permission of Mr. Hasseltine that's worth remembering. I want to read you this this letter and suspend disbelief, if you would. This is the actual letter he sent to this young lady's father asking if he could pursue her in marriage. Here's what he said. I have now to ask whether you can consent to part with your daughter early next spring to see her no more in this world, whether you can consent to her departure and her subjection to the hardships and sufferings of missionary life, 
whether you can consent to her exposure to the dangers of the ocean, to the fatal influence of the southern climate of India, to every kind of want and distress, to degradation, insult, persecution, and perhaps a violent death. Can you consent to all this for the sake of him who left his heavenly home and died for her and for you, for the sake of perishing immortal souls, for the sake of Zion and the glory of God. Can you consent to all this in hope of soon meeting your daughter in the world of glory with a crown of righteous, brightened with the acclamations of praise which shall redound to her Savior from heathens saved through her means from eternal woe and despair? Now, I have a daughter. <laughs> As the report goes, her father amazingly said she could make up her own mind. Later she wrote to her friend and said this, I feel willing and expect, if nothing in providence prevents, to spend my days in this world in heathen lands. Yes, Lydia. I have about come to the determination to give up all my comforts and enjoyments here, sacrifice my affection to relatives and friends, and go where God, in his providence, shall see fit to place me. Now, I, I, when I read those two letters, it seems to me like language from another world, like language from another way of life, from another way of thinking about life. It, it, it seems like one of those mythical letters you hear from stories about Robin Hood and King Arthur or something, some kind of magical, mythical land that's fit for movies and books but isn't real life. And I have to remind myself that this was a real young man. It was a real father. It was a real young lady. This was a real letter. He opened it up, and those were the words that this father read. That was the proposal that this young man made to this young woman. And, and knowing that it was real, it, it strikes me what a difference between their faith and mine, between their view of God and mine. And I think we need to be shaken up at times by the heritage of our forefathers in the faith, like the Judsons, and more importantly, like the church in Antioch that sent out Paul and Barnabas and John Mark and the adventures that Paul went on for the gospel, which is really the remainder of the book of Acts. It just chronicles Paul's journeys and what he faced and what he suffered. And of course, no one today is called to be Paul in terms of his authority or his calling as an apostle or the leader of the multitude of churches that he planted. Nobody is, is called to that same role, but everyone is called to that same faith. That's why we have this story preserved, and I think it's also why God allows stories like the Judsons and Mr. Hasseltine. I mean, wouldn't any normal father, speaking in very gracious and gentle terms, say, my, my dear, it would seem this man has a calling, but it would also seem better if he could do that calling single. <laughs> wouldn't that be your very wise, judicious response? I understand that he's exciting, but you don't want to hold him back. <laughs> Wouldn't it be better to let him go and give his life to the Lord? Let us pray for him. We'll take an offering. I mean, would, wouldn't that be the, the, the normal response? And for this young lady, listen to what she says. I'll give up all my comforts and go where God in his providence see fit to place me. There's something about Acts that is divinely intended to wake us up from the normalcy, the commonplace type of religion that we normally exercise in our country, that, that I normally exercise. 
the kind of thinking about God that segments him to a Sunday morning that perhaps gives us moments of excitement when other people sacrifice for the gospel, that, that when we think about otherworldly ways of thinking, we, we tend to think they're, they're for the unusual, the extreme, the radical. But the Bible is for every Christian. The Bible is for every Christian. This heritage is for you. And if you're five years old or you're 45 years old or you're 65 years old, this word is for you. And as we've said over and over, it is not intended just so that we can pass a Bible history test. Where did Paul and Barnabas leave from? Well, they left from Antioch. No, that's, that's not the intention. The Bible always intends transformation, confirmation, way of thinking that is different. And that's what Paul's journeys and the journeys that are launched here in this passage, that's what they intend to do to us. The Bible does not intend to fit itself into our existing life. It intends to shape our existing life to conform to its pattern. The Bible does not intend to fit itself into our existing life. It intends to shape our life into its pattern. Adoniram Judson said this, It's helpful to let this appeal come to us. He says, let me beg you, beg you not to rest contented with the commonplace religion that is now so prevalent. Let me beg you not to rest contented with the commonplace, I love that word, the commonplace religion that is now so prevalent. We can think about this, being in the Bible Belt, being in a southern state where commonplace religion, we, we, can, we can list what that looks like, can't we? Commonplace religion, a kind of comfortable way of viewing God in the Bible where the Bible fits into a very normal mode of life. But Paul and Barnabas and the Antioch church and his adventures planting churches for the gospel, they're they're intending to wake us up to a different mode of life, a kind of life where the Judson's letters to one another do not seem so out of keeping with the way we would think. Where we would read that letter and think, I can see myself taking that kind of action because I love the same Savior and the Bible has woken me up to a different mode of existence as well. This passage, and and really many of the following passages about Paul and Barnabas and others that joined Paul on these missions, they're all about the sovereign Lord spreading his gospel through the courageous faith of his church. That's what I think is happening in this passage. The sovereign Lord is spreading his gospel through by means of the courageous faith of his church. The power is the Lord's, the message is the Lord's, but the means is a courageous, sacrificial church that sends out preachers, that gives up comforts, that declares itself to be living for a different kind of world. The sovereign Lord is spreading his gospel through the courageous faith of his church. Now, he does that in two ways through this this particular section. He calls the church, and then he conquers his enemies. You see those two sections. First, we have this opening paragraph where Paul and Barnabas are sent out. So he calls the church to mission. He calls them to mission. And then we have this next story when they first arrive on the island of Cyprus where he is conquering enemies as the word goes forth. He calls his church and he conquers his enemies. That's what the Lord is doing. And the faith of the church is the means, it's the instrument that God does those things through. He calls the church. Notice here in verse 1, how there's a description of this church in Antioch. And we see the sort of health and the multiculturalism and the gifted leaders that the church has. There's prophets and teachers. Barnabas, he's this encouraging pastor who came from Jerusalem when this church was first founded. Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene. The point seems to be there's people from, this church is sort of like a prototype of the multicultural effect of the gospel. People from all over the Mediterranean and from social differences as well. Menaean, it says, a member of the court of Herod, the Tetrarch and Saul. So you have intellectual leaders, you have leaders who had previous social standing, leaders from different racial backgrounds. 
And they are, it says in verse 2, worshiping the Lord and fasting. And then the Holy Spirit somehow speaks to them in verse 2, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. I just want to make two points about this this calling. First of all, it comes to this church that is in some ways in a delightful situation because of the gifts of leaders God has given them. I mean, they are what every North American church that I know that loves the Bible wants to be. They have this multi-ethnic situation. They have multiple leaders that are extremely gifted. I mean, they, they have Paul himself. The Apostle Paul teaches regularly at the Antioch Church. So the guy who wrote Romans does his Sunday school class on the justification by faith that we have in Christ. I mean, think about that. Next week, Paul will be leading us, brothers and sisters, in justification. Uh, Please come Sunday at 9. Paul will be preaching. And after that, if you would need counseling, we have Barnabas the Encourager from the Jerusalem Church. He would love to meet with you on Saturdays. For any marriage problems, please come to Barnabas. He would love to comfort you. Oh, and by the way, we are now talking about multicultural uh, evangelism. Lucius from Cyrene, he is going to talk about his experience of sharing people from different cultures. This is their church. This is their church. No wonder it says in Antioch the people were first called Christians. I mean, th- these guys had overwhelming gifts in terms of leaders and speakers and prophets, a New Testament prophet, apparently one who speaks with a kind of anointing from the Lord. It, it's this incredible church. And you notice in verse 2 what they are doing. They are worshiping the Lord and fasting. So the call comes to a church that is dedicating itself to the Lord, declaring themselves to belong to the Lord, loving him in worship and fasting, meaning they are, they are setting aside food as a way of saying we are available to God. We live for the Lord. That's what fasting is in the New Testament. It's, it's temporarily setting aside food as a way of saying to the Lord, we love you more than anything. So that's what they're doing. You have this apparently group of leaders and they're just praying together. They're worshiping the Lord. They're declaring themselves to belong to the Lord, that he is their sovereign, that they love him as savior. And they fasted apparently during their prayer time to say to the Lord, 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 you're more important to us than food even. We'd rather go hungry and receive from you. We are living for you. And then God speaks to them. He speaks into their comfortable plurality of gifted pastors. He speaks into their probably well-sized church. He speaks into their declaration and dedication, surrendering themselves to the Lord. And he says, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. You can feel almost the seriousness that they take this call. It says in in verse 3, after fasting and praying. So apparently they they fasted and prayed some more. No wonder. Can you imagine having Paul and Barnabas, early heroes of the church, as your pastors? And then all of a sudden you get this news. They're, They're supposed to leave. They're supposed to go out from us and go to another work in a distant place. And we won't see them for a long time. This is not email communication. You cannot talk to these people on the phone. There is no FaceTime with Paul. It is gone. He is out of your life. The Lord is calling them to give, to send, and for Paul and Barnabas to go, to leave, to give up, to go, as Anne Hasseltine said, where God in his providence shall see fit to put me. There's this call to the church that comes. Now, we know the rest of the story because we've read the scriptures. We know that Paul and Barnabas successfully planted churches throughout the Mediterranean, that God used them as this mighty apostle. But try to put yourself in the situation of this Antioch church. Your beloved pastors, Paul and Barnabas, are to be sent out. They will not minister to you anymore. They will be given to the Lord for the sake of the world. 
They, they will not be available to you anymore. I know that he's your favorite preacher, but he will not be preaching to you anymore. He will now be preaching to the synagogues on Cyprus. He will now travel to distant cities. He will now raise up new churches. Other people will benefit from this man that you previously have loved and respected, and you are to send him out. Imagine for the fellow pastors. Well, who's going to preach? I mean, if Paul isn't here and Barnabas takes care of all of the encouragement ministry in the church, who's going to do that? How are we going to make this work? Can our church exist without these men? Can we really sacrifice and send them? We, we need to feel the, the real life of this situation. Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them, it says. Let me ask you a question. Let's imagine that God brought up some opportunity in your life to send or go like this. Are you ready for this? Are you ready for this? Or is this unthinkable? Here's a question. Is the biblical model of missional living unimaginable? Is it unthinkable? Is it out of the ordinary? Is it even dangerous a bit? Is it unthinkable to you and me? If God could come to you and say, set apart for me some treasured part of life, some treasured person, some valuable, comfortable aspect of who you are, set apart for me for the work to which I have called you or called them? Are we ready for this kind of God interrupting our lives? Are we ready for that? Brothers and sisters, this is why God gave us acts, so that we would be ready for that. Now, thankfully, nobody ever has to give up Paul again. Only one time. But we have to give up other treasured things and other valuable things. And in my experience, church planting and the work of the gospel in a local community and extra local work, either near or far, it always requires sacrifice of things that you'd much rather have than send. It requires leaving things you'd much rather keep than leave. It always requires that. It never changes. Just a little bit about my own story. So I, I, when I was 10 years old, we joined a church that had been a church plant from Cleveland, Ohio, uh, three years before. So you're younger than our church. And I came into that church, and it changed my life at 10 years old. It changed. I understand about God more profoundly, the grace of God. I made friends that provoked me in maturity, transformed my parents' marriage in that church. It was this profound situation. Well, the only reason I had that experience was because a bunch of families decided, who lived in Cleveland, I think we're going to leave everything we know. We're going to leave friends. We're going to leave our comforts. We're going to sell our house. We're going to leave our locales and every our normal functional existence. We're going to move across the country. We're going to plant a new church. We have no idea what's going to happen. We have no idea the results. We have no idea, but, but we think God has work for us to do there. And so they traveled, and then three years later, after their investment, I show up, a little 10-year-old boy, and they begin to change my life. Now, I can tell you from personal experience, because that same thing happened to me when I was a senior in high school. My family said, I think we're supposed to move and start this new church. We're going to go across the country. We're gonna, we think God has something for us here, and we're leaning into it. We're going to leave friends. We're going to leave close, uh, familiar places that we love. You're not going to be able to finish your high school athletic career. You're not going to be able to do any of that. We're going to go across the country. It requires sacrifice. It requires thinking about the previously unthinkable just like I'm sure it did for Antioch. The story of Paul and the rest of Acts can't be separated from the story of Antioch in Acts 13. We have people in this church that can tell you by personal experience what it is like to leave everything that is comfortable and familiar to start a new church. We wouldn't have a church if there weren't people who had said, I want to be like Antioch. I want to be an Antioch Christian that sends or goes for the sake of the sovereign Lord who is spreading his gospel through the courageous faith of his church. God is calling his church, and he's still calling his church today. 
He's calling us. He's calling us to live in a way where the Judsons don't seem alien to us. He's calling his church. He is calling you. Let me speak very personally. God is calling you to courageous faith in his work for the spread of his gospel. God is calling you. I can say that on the authority of God's word. God is calling you. Now, maybe you're called to send. Maybe you're called to go. But you are not called to do nothing. You are not called to be a commonplace religious person. God is calling you and me to live our lives for the spreading of this gospel, to do and think about what might be unthinkable if we hadn't met Jesus, if we hadn't read these passages in these scriptures. God is calling his church. Is our life characterized by courageous faith in the Lord for the spread of his gospel? Is our life characterized by courageous faith in the Lord for the spread of his gospel? Some might be sent into a new type of service within the church. Are we prepared to sacrifice in order to fill their place? A dear friend might be launched into a new small group because yours has grown too large. Are you prepared to send them with courageous faith? In my experience, the big moments of courageous faith come from a pattern of little moments of courageous faith. The big moments, no, nobody goes to uh, Peru if they're not willing to go to a new small group, okay? No, no, nobody does that. No, nobody like launches to Nepal if they're not first willing to launch to Austin. That's what I love about Josh and Kirsten and, and Janice. Look, they didn't start going to Nepal. They started coming to Austin from a different state. But those little moments of sacrifice then build your faith for bigger moments of sacrifice. If, if we're not willing to go across the street to have coffee with a fellow Christian, we're definitely not going to be excited about sending a dear loved one across the world to preach the gospel to people we don't know. One day, one day, we're going to stand up here and make an announcement about sending a church plant. And we're going to say to all of you, we want you to pray about that. We want you to pray and consider the unthinkable that you would leave the dear friends you have, that you would leave close family that you have, that you would sell the house that you love and adore, that you would give up the job that's perfect for you, and you would consider going and starting a new work somewhere where they need a gospel testimony. One day, we're gonna, and we're going to say, look, here's the people that are going, and inevitably it's going to include some leader that is well-loved and cherished in our community. We're going to say, now, I know this is hard to hear because it's hard to imagine life without him. But, but he feels called to start a church. We don't have any plans like that right now, so don't get nervous, but do get nervous, okay? Get nervous, all right? And I can't tell you who it's going to be. I don't know who it's going to be, but at some point, there is going to be some dearly loved leader in our church. We're going to say, he, he feels called, and we feel called to send. So we have to start thinking about the unthinkable. Now, we're, we're, we're seeking to do this in little ways where we can. We're, we're seeking to do this by sending Aaron and the group of you that are going next week to Houston. In some ways, that's taking a step in the direction of Antioch. It's a meaningful step because our culture says Saturdays are sacred. And we say, yes, they are sacred, but they're sacred to the Lord. Amen. It's a good step. We're excited. What are we excited about? What, what, what's the best thing I could do on Saturday? You know what the best thing I could do? Some of you are saying, the best thing I could do is to help this faithful church that's been meeting in rented facilities for 30 years to get into a permanent facility that's going to serve them and they suffered with the flooding and everything. We want to make it easy for them. We want to help our brothers and sisters in this joyful moment. We want to be, as Aaron said, the final push that gets them in after all the difficulties they've had. What's that doing? It's being like the Antioch church, like Paul and Barnabas and saying, the Lord is calling his church to courageous, sacrificial faith for the sake of the spreading gospel. And I want to be a part of that. I don't want to be what Henry Judson said is a commonplace religious person. He is calling his church. And secondly, he is conquering his enemies. You notice here it says that they were sent out by the Holy Spirit, which is true of every Christian working for the gospel, whether they're going across the street 
to talk to their neighbor in the name of Jesus, or they're going across the world to hand out MP3 players. They are sent out by the Holy Spirit. And they went down to Seleucia. Now, these names we're not familiar with, but they're just normal names of towns and cities. They went down to a coastal city called Seleucia. They sailed to Cyprus, an island. They arrived at the city. They proclaimed the word of God. That's what they're wanting to do. That's the definition of why they're going. They're preaching to the synagogues of the Jews, proclaiming Jesus as the Messiah. They have this young man, John, who is assisting them, who was sent from the Jerusalem church to Antioch. So he's a long way from home. And when they had gone through the whole island as far as Paphos, they came upon a certain magician, it says, a Jewish false prophet named Bar-Jesus. The name Bar-Jesus is ironic because it means son of Jesus, And it's ironic because the very people who are proclaiming the name of Jesus come across this one who claims Jesus' name for himself, but is actually opposing the message of Jesus. So he's not a follower of Jesus at all. He's with, apparently, a, a court magician of sorts. They would have had those back then. They believed in court magicians with magical powers. Of this governor, this proconsul, Sergius Paulus, And this governor hears about Barnabas and Saul. He hears they're preaching the word of God. And so he calls them to him. He wants to hear the message. But this magician, this court magician, opposes them. You can imagine him whispering in the proconsul's ear saying, this is ridiculous. How could anyone crucified on a cross be God's chosen one? They're telling you a fool's tale. Don't listen, your honor. Don't listen to this news about Jesus Christ dying for sinners. Don't listen to this news about God's Messiah, the one crucified and risen. How could anyone rise from the dead? This is a false tale, he says. Don't you dare listen to this. You'll be a fool for believing in Jesus. But Saul, who is also called Paul, is filled with the Holy Spirit, it says in verse 9. And he looks at this man, this magician, who is intentionally opposing the gospel. He looks at him, and he calls him what he is. He says, you son of the devil. Now, that would take some courage, wouldn't it? This is a court magician. This is not some traveling, you know, jokester clown. This is a court magician. He's a high-ranking position. Here he is. He's a court magician, and he's got the ear of the governor, and he's on the inside council and everything, and he's telling him, this Jesus thing is ridiculous. These people are fools. You should not listen to this. Well, Paul stands up. He looks at the guy. Imagine this in like a a normal city council meeting. He looks at the guy and just declares, you son of the devil, how dare you make crooked the way of the Lord? Feel the awkwardness of that. I mean, can you feel that? It, uh, yeah, I know Paul, we think of him as this mythical character and he planted churches and amazing, but just, just feel the human interaction of that. He's aware this man is opposing, he is blaspheming Jesus. He's trying to resist the gospel message and Paul stands up and says, you, you are not a son of Jesus. You are a son of the devil. You're trying to pervert the truth. You're trying to turn this man away from the only hope of salvation. The only hope of salvation is found in Jesus Christ, the crucified one who died for sinners like this man and this is his only hope of heaven and you dare to oppose it. And then we have this miraculous story where Paul receives apparently by just divine revelation that God is going to judge this magician right in front of the whole court council governor. So he judges him and he says, you will be blind. So the guide will become blind. The counselor will become helpless. You you feel the irony of Acts. We've talked about this a lot. The irony of Acts comes into play again. The man who's supposed to be counseling 
the leading, as it were. The governor has to be led by the hand because he can't see anymore. The man who's supposed to have supernatural insight can't even see his hand in front of his face. The, the irony is there. Who is actually powerful in this situation? It's not the apparently powerful governor and his magical aid. It's God who can declare in a word, you will not be allowed to stop the spread of the gospel. You will not be allowed to do it. Now, again, we don't read Acts as some sort of uh, (laughs) practical steps for every Christian evangelist, okay? It's it's not like, okay, here's what you do. Go out to 6th Street and just begin to call out blindness on people uh, if they are not following Jesus. And blind and also the flu. And you also will have chicken pox next week. No, that's not the, the point here is not like we be like Paul and go be like the, the anti doctor for anybody who resists the message. You don't believe in Jesus? I declare a plague a hives upon you. We, we, no, that's not what, what's going on here. What is going on is we're supposed to see whose power is superior. Whose power is superior? When we step out in courageous, sacrificial faith, we will experience the resistance of the enemy. Now, we might not encounter a a court magician, because we don't tend to have those. But we will encounter people intentionally resisting the spread of the gospel. We will encounter spiritual resistance. In my experience, the more sacrificial and courageous a Christian is in stepping out to proclaim God and to be used for the spread of his kingdom in nonconformist kind of ways, abnormal kind of ways, the more they experience strange and unusual difficulties, whether in people or in practical situations. And I believe that like Paul, they are encountering spiritual opposition to the spread of the name of Jesus. Jesus. It doesn't mean you're going to encounter a demon-possessed man the next time you try to share the gospel, but you, you, are, you'll, you tell me if this isn't the testimony of everybody you've ever met who takes courageous steps for the gospel. They begin to encounter the opposition of some kind of usually confusing or difficult evil opposing them. It, it's often the case. You, you, often in our country, it's in strange, unusual, unexplainable kinds of things. It's true in the scriptures, evil opposes. There is an enemy in this world, and he is opposed to the message of Jesus. He is opposed to any Christian that wakes up from a kind of slumbering church existence and gives their life sacrificially for the name of Jesus Christ. What this passage is saying is, when you take that step of faith and you send or you go or you support a person like Paul preaching the gospel, when you take that step of faith and you begin to encounter that resistance, remember this story that Jesus is more powerful than the apparently powerful evil facing you. Remember this story that this apparently prominent court magician whispering in the ear of this governor, was struck blind by God himself in judgment over his opposition. Jesus is conquering his enemies in order to build the faith of the courage of the church. Imagine when when the church got news of this. The early church, this is written many, many years later, and, and, and a young church taught in class, let me, let me tell you, because I know it's scary, and you can go around the corner, and there's the big temple to Artemis, a big temple to Artemis, and you're a little Christian kid in Ephesus, and there's this big temple to Artemis, these crazy priests, and they worship that kind of God. I know it seems really scary. Let me tell you what happened to Paul. Paul was preaching the gospel, and this court magician, he was whispering in the ear of the governor that this was all ridiculous, and he should kick these people out. You know what God did? He said that man was going to be struck blind and no longer able to resist the word of the gospel. Now, we don't know what God will do in our day and age, but we know he's the same God, and is just as powerful. So you don't have to be afraid of that temple around the corner. And you don't have to be afraid of those power mongers in Hollywood. You don't have to be afraid of government officials who resist the church. And you don't have to be afraid of the media message that says Christianity is foolish. And you don't have to be afraid of your neighbor and what they'll think of you if you stand for Jesus. Yes. 
First John 4.4 4 says, Little children, you are from God and have overcome them, for the one who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. You notice once again, like it does so often in Acts, the summarizing statement in verse 12. Then the proconsul believed when he saw what had occurred, but the basis for his believing was not so much the miracle, it was that he was astonished, it says, at the teaching of the Lord. So Paul preaches to him this ludicrous message that God the Son came down to earth, lived a perfect life, died on a cross as a substitute for sinners, was raised from the dead, will judge the living and the dead, and this man, Jesus, who is God the Son, offers himself to you, and if you believe in him, you can be saved, and you can have eternal life, and you can be with God forever, and even you, proconsul of Rome, you can turn to him and believe, and the proconsul is amazed at this teaching of the Lord. Lord, he turns in faith to Jesus and he is converted. And the church receives this report from Luke, writing it down in this book and says, look, look what Jesus is doing through the courageous faith of his church. Antioch received the call. They send, they release Paul. Paul and Barnabas go with this young guy, John Mark, they say goodbye to friends and relatives and dear ones in a comfortable life in this wonderfully diverse church with many gifted men leading them. They, they send them out in faith, dedicating themselves to the Lord. And the very first thing that seems to happen of note is they encounter immediate resistance from the evil one, but that resistance is judged by God and the proconsul himself believes and they see the power of God at work spreading his gospel. Normally, we see supernatural power when we take steps of courageous faith. Normally, we see supernatural power when we take steps of courageous faith. This passage, and a lot of passages like it in Acts, they're designed to make us want to see supernatural power. They make us want to see it in our day, in my day, in your life. Wednesday night and Thursday morning and the way you think about your budget next month and the way you think about lifestyle choices and it, it makes us want it. It makes us want to wake up and live for a different kind of kingdom like the Judsons did. To wake up from the kind of enchantment that buzzes around commonplace religion in our day and age and to live for a God who is spreading his eternal gospel through the courageous choices of his church. In the classic book, Pilgrim's Progress, which John Bunyan wrote, one of the stories talks about two men journeying towards heaven. It's a metaphor. If you've never read the book, it's a metaphor. They're journeying towards heaven, going through their life. And at one point, these two men, named Hopeful and Christian, come upon a place, an area, and they begin to be exceedingly tired, exceedingly sleepy. John Bunyan writes, I saw then in my dream that they went until they came into a certain country whose air naturally tended to make one drowsy. And if he came a stranger into it, and here hopeful, one of the men began to be very dull and heavy of sleep. And he said to Christian, I do now begin to grow so drowsy. I can scarcely hold up my eyes. Let us lie down here and take one nap. Christian said, by no means, less sleeping, we never wake more. Hopeful said, why, my brother, sleep is sweet to the laboring man. We may be refreshed if we take a nap. But Christian said, do you not remember that one of the shepherds bade us beware of the enchanted ground? He meant by that that we should beware of sleeping. Wherefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. Let us watch and be sober. I think that Christian religion in our country sometimes is like living on the enchanted ground. It tends to drowsiness. It tends to sleepiness. 
It, it surprises me, given the lack of extreme suffering that American Christians normally face. Normally, that some face terrible suffering physically and so forth. But, but normally, in terms of culture, face very little suffering compared to our brothers and sisters. But American Christians, almost, almost without exception, if you ask them how, you're, how they're doing, they'll answer, I'm very busy and I'm tired a lot. How are you doing? So busy. And I'm tired a lot. I think it was an interesting juxtaposition, isn't it? Very little cultural suffering. Very busy. Tired a lot. Why is that, do we think? Well, one reason might be we are busy often about the things that tend to make one drowsy rather than tend to make one full of the Spirit and desiring to see God move mightily and in power. We're often busy about the things that tend to make one drowsy rather than busy with the things that cause you to be filled with the Spirit and desiring to see God move in power. It strikes me, when you hear stories of people that are, that are laboring endlessly for the gospel, that, that they, are, they are tired, but they are not exhausted. You ever had that experience? You talk to someone who is living their life, going and sending and giving and loving and living for something very different. They, they tend to be, sure, they're tired. They go to sleep tired at the end of the day, but they're not exhausted. They're not drowsy. Well, there's a kind of enchanted ground. And like Christian's warning, this passage speaks to us. It says, don't go to sleep on the enchanted ground. Don't sleep in the atmosphere of this commonplace religion that we live in. Don't assume that the Bible intends to just slip in to our normal way of life. Assume that God is calling us to live like Antioch, to see in Paul and Barnabas the heroes of the faith, the founders of the faith we cherish, and to live in a very different way. To see God spreading his gospel through the courageous choices of his church, the faith of his church. The sovereign God is calling his church. He's conquering enemies, and he's calling us to to be a part of that mission as well. John Piper humbly says this, I am wired by nature to love the same toys that the world loves. I start to fit in. I start to love what others love. I start to call earth home. Before you know it, I'm calling luxuries needs and using my money just the way unbelievers do, I begin to forget the war. I don't think much about people perishing. Missions and unreached people drop out of my mind. I stop dreaming about the triumphs of grace, and I sink into a secular mindset that looks first to what man can do, not what God can do. It is a terrible sickness. And I thank God for those who have forced me again and again toward a wartime mindset. I think Paul, Barnabas, Antioch, the encounter on Cyprus with this magician, I think it stirs us to a wartime mindset. Brothers and sisters, let me, let me ask this question. Do you think of yourselves right now, right now, as called to a kind of courageous faith? Right now, fathers, do you, do you lead your families in a way that is a courageous faith kind of mindset. Mothers, are you calling your children to a courageous faith kind of life in the sovereignty of God? Friends, are you, are you stirring each other to a courageous faith kind of life in the sovereignty of God? Is your mind filled with thoughts about ordinary Christian existence in this enchanted ground that we live in or extraordinary life lived in the power of the Holy Spirit for the glory of God? Again, I'm not saying you should immediately go home and sell your house and move to Timbuktu. I'm not, I'm not saying that. I am saying you should go and say to the Lord, Lord, this house is yours, and whatever you would have me do with it, it is for your glory. I'm not saying you would, you would stop uh, meeting and loving your friends. I'm saying you keep doing that, but you say, Lord, my, my friendships are for your glory. If you, if you need me to, to start a new group or to move into a new situation like they did in Antioch, I, I'm eager to do that for your glory. 
I'm saying you look at your budget and say, Lord, I, I, I don't think there's anything evil about this budget, but Lord, if, if there's another use for this money, tell me how to do this for your glory. I'm saying when you hear calls about missions and going and starting and serving, you don't assume, well, I, I can't fit that into my life. You assume, no, I want to be like Antioch. How can, I, how can I give and serve and go and sacrifice for your glory? Don't assume that fatigue is always solved by stopping something. Sometimes fatigue is solved by starting something because you encounter the power of God working through you. We live in enchanted ground. And yes, sleep is good for the hardworking man. Rest is good. Entertainment is a gift. Normal human existence is part of God's gift to us. But, but, gifts are not God. And we are called to be like Antioch and Paul and Barnabas and live our lives on a mission for the spreading of the gospel, trusting in our sovereign God. And as Anne said, who we will see one day in glory, we go and we send and we give up and we labor as God in his providence sees fit to put us. The sovereign Lord is still calling his church, conquering his enemies, and urging us to courageous faith for the spread of his gospel. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I pray that you would use our church mightily in your kingdom. Lord, I pray for the day-to-day -day moments the day-to-day -day moments of encouragement, the day-to-day -day moments of sacrifice, the day-to-day -day moments of living an unordinary life, an extraordinary life. Lord, I pray that you would cleanse us all, Lord. Cleanse me from the enchanted ground. Help me to see where its effects are creeping into my soul. Help me to see it, Lord. Help me to see how media sometimes creeps in and becomes an enchanted ground. Help me to see where, uh, Lord, pleasures of this life are creeping in and becoming an enchanted ground. And help me to be more like my brothers and sisters who give their all for the sake of your name. Do ordinary things, but ordinary things with faith for the sake of your name. As we sang earlier, speak, O oh Lord. Speak. Your word, your authority, your call, your gospel, your grace, your heaven, these are the things that we want to define us. Speak to us. Speak to my brothers and sisters, Lord. Speak to this church. Speak to us in private. Speak to us as you did at Antioch. Speak to us to give and go and serve and sacrifice. Speak to us to love and labor and carry. Speak to us to feel the power of your Holy Spirit to do what we cannot do in our own strength. Speak to us and send us and use us for the sake of your name and for the glory of the great gospel you have given to us. Use us, Lord, we pray. In Jesus' name.